I I performed it and then the response was was unbelievable. I mean, people were talking about how much courage it took to perform a piece on that platform and be direct and overt about love towards black women. So I never saw it from that lens because it was something that they felt was a courageous thing. They felt like they were being, you know, um, undervalued, unseen, you know, and I, I didn't see it from their lens, but so many women came up to me and then I made a video and then it uh, went viral on Facebook, 3 million views. And then yes. from there, you know, I, I set on a journey to, to now speak life into that one segment for a moment. I did Dear Mama and some other pieces that the, the art and the poetry was, was gaining traction in legs. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to create a stage play called Atris TW, which speaks to the love experience and two sold out nights. So now I'm rolling with this thing and I'm seeing like, okay, you, you're also building your confidence and also seeing that you have a purpose in delivering this message. You're listening to the Grind and Gratitude Show. Welcome to the Grind and Gratitude Show. If this is your first time tuning in, thank you so much. If you're an avid listener, you already know I got a lot of love for you. My name is Danny Stone, also known as Coach Stone is in the building. What's going on, people? You guys know how we do it here. Every single time I bring you an episode, it's something from the heart. It's something that you're telling me that you want or it's something that I think that I want to learn more about and dive into. And so I haven't had a guest for a while, and I'm super excited that I have this guest today. Um, I've been wanting to get him on, on the podcast and on the show for a while, and it just so happens that we cross paths and he can do it. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my guest, and then we're going to jump in. So first of all, I like this. He is an, an agape ambassador love experience architect and content creator. Now I know you all, you really want to know who this guy is, right? Those three words just, I mean, those three phrases just stood out to me. Okay, he's a poet, he's a host, uh, a love and mental health advocate with a new vision for love right away, love that. He's a melting pot of cultural experiences which can be heard and seen through his artistry. His depth and introspective introspection is felt every on every stage and every page now his purpose is to show love is always available present and exists in all of us his vision which i love to love every day like it's your last his mission restore love through artistic expression and there's one thing that i'm going to ask him about uh, when, um, when we jump into this, but I really love this slogan and this tagline that he has. And it's really every day can be Valentine's Day. Please help me welcome my brother, Nigel Birch Jr. is in the building. How are you doing, man? I'm feeling good. I love the intro, man. That was dope. Now, listen, it's all you. It's all you. And once I see all this stuff about love, I'm like, man, I really... I really feel like we need more love in the world, you I know? Totally Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, last, about a year and a half ago, I did a, an online event and I'm going to have to do it again. It's called get back to love. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you more about that later, but it was just, I just felt like we needed more love. So I did this online event and brought a whole bunch of people together. And we had this conversation about love and self-forgiveness and all these kinds of things. But so I'm, a, I'm, I'm definitely a believer of love, man. So, yeah, totally, totally. so Nigel, before we get into all the love stuff, like how did you start in the spoken word and, and, you know, writing and, and producing, how did you get involved in this? How did this all get started? Um, there's layers that I, I want to shout out to my, my father. My father was, um, he went to school for journalism and then he went to business, but he set the tone. He used to write um, regularly. And also he used to write poems for me for every year, a birthday milestone. Wow. And um, I used to copy his pattern, his style and uh, his way of, of freeing his mind and free speech and expression. And he's one that just, he'll sit in a room and he'll sit silent and he's very quiet, but then he puts his pen to pad and you just go. So the early onset of, of poetry started with my father. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think I want to say the idea of love comes from my mother. I think I've never met someone that loves unconditionally the way she does. So 
mirror, you know, when you put the pen to the understanding of love that I've, I've taken from, and my dad loves well too as well, but mom loves in a way that I was able to study, I would say to the best of my ability and express and articulate, and then tie that with the skill set from my father, created this whole idea of, of poetry and love. Uh, I was, I was raised in, I grew up in Toronto till I was 16, then I moved to the States. I was in the States for 13 years. Mm. I went to high school, college, so I had an opportunity to hit a couple stages. I remember the first time I went on stage and I, and I bombed and I was ready. <laughs> I, was, I was at home rehearsing, I was good. And then I got there and I started throwing back some, I don't know what I was drinking, I was nervous. <laughs> and I started strong, I was like, da 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 da. And then I paused and I was stuck there for about two minutes found myself again, but then it was like Will Smith and, and Fresh Prince. I ran off that stage and I never went back for, for years. Wow, <laughs> wow. And that was in Atlanta. I was just trying to diff a couple of different things from poetry to acting. The scene was really big at the time. And then, so I put on the back seat and I wasn't really doing anything with it. Um, always been one in that time to talk about love and have you know, conversations, parties about, you know, lived experiences and how people are navigating that. So that's, that was always part of the experience. But when I came back to Toronto, I think four years removed from the States back in Toronto, I was able to connect with Troy Crossfield that gave me an opportunity to do a play. Mm. And um, I think what that did was we established this idea that, you know, you're going to go on the stage and con conquer this fear that you had of, possibly public speaking or, you know, maybe the trauma or the trigger that had formed from the incident in Atlanta that deterred me from hitting the stage. Right. So I went back on that stage and I was still, you know, legs were shaking, but I had an opportunity to do a poetry piece on that stage to open the play. So when I was able to complete it, that was the first because I was like, okay, I made it. I, I completed the whole piece. That's good. But then the response was good. And then after I was able to get reps through theatrical, and uh, learning through, you know, the director on, you know, how to slow my speech down and, and understanding that mistakes are part of the process. And I was able to get coached like a pseudo mentor about how to, you know, enunciate and speak on a larger stage. So then with that, I, I was studying and looking at what this was about. And I said, you know, I can write my own play. And I also feel com comfortable enough to write. So I wrote a piece called Black Woman and uh, I performed it at the Black Diamond Ball. And it, that was a piece that I didn't, I wrote and I shared with my aunt and she says, nice, this piece is something special. And I said, oh, my aunt told me that, you know, I'm expecting to say that. Right, right. His family, you know, it was their family. So, you know, everything's good. <laughs> right. So then I, I, I performed it and then the response was, was unbelievable. I mean, people were talking about how much courage it took to, perform a piece on that platform and be direct and overt about love towards black women. So I never saw mm -hmm. it from that lens because mm -hmm. it was something that they felt was a courageous thing. They felt like they were being, you know, um, undervalued, unseen, you know, and I, I didn't see it from their lens, but so many women came up to me and then I made a video and then it uh, went viral on Facebook, 3 million views. And then yes. from there, you know, I, I set on a journey to, to now speak life into that one segment for a moment. I did Dear Mama and some other pieces and the, the art and the poetry was, was gaining traction in legs. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to create a stage play called HSTW, which was, speaks to the love experience and two sold out nights. So now I'm rolling with this thing and I'm seeing like, okay, you, you're also building your confidence and also seeing that you have a purpose in delivering this message. Mm -hmm. um, so then you know, you, you forward and uh, the momentum builds and you create more content and you hit more stages and voila, you, you're gaining the confidence and the ability to know that you have a unique purpose mm. that needs to exist in different spaces. And that's how I began the journey with poetry. And uh, we're here now expanding into other areas because as much as it's funny, because as much as I like the poetry, you know, I've never been one for a representative like this you know, this, this poetry guy, this mystique, there's a place yeah. for me that has a strong voice for advocacy. I like speaking 
about love and not only the romanticized part of it, but how it meshes into the mental health, which I'm sure we'll talk mm, about. Definitely. And um, because I think it's, you know, it's the, the fluff is cool, but then when we're talking about wanting to thrive in generational wealth, I think there's discipline and, and duty that goes into love that we don't really talk about. We talk about just falling, but not sitting in it and, and digesting, you know, what it means to actually grow with somebody and nurture that process. So I try to, to echo those sentiments, the nuances as much as I can in my art versus trying to just romanticize it. And then you go in the situation and then we're like, you know, what happened to the, the service and the surrender and, you know, yeah, the hardship right. that we're not talking about. Right. So man. I'll land wow. the plane there for there. Cause we're going to wow. talk, we're going to talk. Brother, so this <laughs> man, that, I, 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 there's so much to like, there is so much to unpack from what you just said. Like, huh, okay. I think the first piece to unpack is you stood on a stage, mm. you delivered your, 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 um, play your, your, um, talk and it didn't go well yep. and you ran off the stage, but then you were brave enough to come back years later. And I think this is a lesson for a lot of people because when we see our goals and our dreams, or we attempt to do something that we've never done before, there's always a sense of awkwardness and uncomfortable and being uncomfortable and nervousness and then sometimes when people fail they never go back right and so what was it that made you go back because there's somebody who's listening right now who was in that same experience they tried something they failed and they may have never tried again so what was it for you that made you get back on that stage years later i think a a, a couple things i think it was the divine timing, which was when I, if I'm going back to that same conversation, what was funny, there was an, an ad thrown out for the role. Someone sent me an email. They should, said, you should try out for this. And I said, no, nah, still leaning on that fair, mm -hmm. you know, the, the lack mindset at that time. But then my friend hit me up on a separate occasion, separate occasion and said, Nigh, I want, I would love for you to be my scene partner, not knowing it was the same play. Oh. And I said, you know what care, you know, for you, you know, you, I'm comfortable with you. So right. I'll, I'll come through realizing now that's the same play. And then, mm. so that got me to, through the door. So there was a, the fear of, of walking towards the door. She's now holding my hand, walking towards the front. Door. Mm. I still have a chance to jump ship because now we're rehearsing and I'm, I'm still feeling the anxiety. Like you say, the residue, because we all know that anxiety and those things live in the body. So, you know, you're starting to feel a little clammy but then you go through the process and they're like we like you so now you're being affirmed right. on top of now the walk to the door that we think you would be good for the role right so there's these steps we're not even at the stage yet so now we're going through the process now and we're rehearsing and then i'm dropping the ball i'm fumbling i can't remember the lines and then mm. here comes the coach to say just calm down we see something you just have to take your time so now with the coaching, someone's walking you through your fear. So there was somebody that was there mm. to assist me as I'm going through these steps, not knowing inside that I'm saying, I, I don't know if I can do this. And they don't know that, but they could see that there's a struggle. Yeah. And then what was funny, what opened it up, I have a friend named Damien Lloyd. Shout out to Damien, um, great actor. And yeah. during that time, I was doing hosting. I was hosting at the time. And he said, that guy that's hosting is not the same guy we're seeing here. He said, what's happening? He said, that's the guy I want to see. Mm. I said, I don't even know who you are in here because what I saw there was completely different. And then he was the one that allowed me to see that as much as this is one space and it's labeled acting, in the other space, there's strengths that you can have that you can utilize in this space. You just have to tap into it. Mm. So I think to go back to your, to your initial question, I think it was walking to the door and then having people within the room in this space while I was still trying to see if I was good enough to, to be in this space with all these actors were able to support and affirm and encourage me while I was going through that process. And if I didn't have those people, I wouldn't have gone to the stage. If there was no Karen, I wouldn't have attempted. So there was that divine opportunity that called me. But then after that, there was the assistance from those to continue to give me encouragement while I felt like I wanted to retreat. And I know, you know, oftentimes, one of the, the urges out of fear is withdrawal. Mm -hmm. So 
when you have somebody that can intercept that before you're going to withdraw back and then push you forward and say, no, 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 you ain't running away. Right. Then you kind of have to, to go through it, especially when it's done with a level of encouragement and care. So because they did that, I, you know, I thank them. And as well, it allowed me not to retreat and to deal with it and realize that I don't have to catastrophize this. It's not going to be right. the worst case scenario where, you know, if I drop a line, they're going to say, no, you got to go. They're going to say, good job, man. And then seeing everybody else making their same errors, I was like, oh, okay, we're all human. Right. So that pretty much just the, the, the encouragement is what from those, those individuals and the timing. I don't think if it happened any time before that, I would have hit the stage. Yeah. So I think there was divine timing and I was also having the right community members around you to encourage you when you feel like you want to withdraw. Man, that is so powerful. And, and, and I think a lot of people need to hear that. You know, um, in, in, in that, I also take away, like, start before you're ready. Um, I, often, I often tell people, you know, the, the biggest lie we've ever been told is that you just got to believe in yourself to make your dreams happen, you know, mm -hmm. believe it and achieve it. That's not true. Progress equals belief. Come on. And I say this every single time because nobody believes in themselves. <laughs> no one believes in their dream when they first start. It's the progress that you make. Absolutely. And so that's one of the things that I saw in your story. And Absolutely. another thing is borrow somebody else's belief in you until you can believe in yourself. Come on now. Come on now. Like, and that's exactly what happened. Like you were, weren't ready, but you were borrowing other people's belief. And I think that's a big lesson for anyone right now who's feeling stuck. Go out there, connect with a community or people that believe in you until you can believe in yourself. Because some of us don't have people like that in our lives. Yes. Right? Yes. We're around a lot of negative people. And every time we try to do something, we have people that are going to tell us all the reasons it's not going to work. So we have to be a part of a community, whether it's an online community, going out to like networking events and different types of events to be surrounded by those individuals. Because I've had people like that in my life and you have, but a lot of people don't, right? I totally agree. Well said. So, uh, man, that's a journey. And so I, I, I love that. And, and I also love how you took something from your dad with the writing and you took this yeah. real love, unconditional love from your mom. And you really combined mm -hmm. both of those things together for yeah. your artistry. Like, yeah. what did you see from your parents kind of growing up in terms of their relationship that just yeah. just made you who you are and made this mission so much more uh, powerful for you to pursue? That's an amazing question. I, my parents, I'll start by saying my parents got divorced when I was 13. Um, and even after the divorce, their relationship, they were always still friends. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was never any negative comments about not only mom or dad, but men or women. Mm. Uh, I, my parents led a very egalitarian household where they did what had to be done. Mm -hmm. um, in the sense where mom at the time we were living in Pickering. So she was flying out to Scarborough, which means that her days were 12 hours. So he was the chef. He mm -hmm. was the soccer dad. And then, you know, on weekends it would switch. And then, um, you know, I saw a lot of my parents and I also saw a lot of times where family, the community, you know, congregated in our home. So there was always love around me. And because I was, at, I was, probably the, the oldest male cousin around. I didn't have my little brother yet. I was able to express myself in those spaces. And I was the entertainment, so to speak, for them. And I was able to freely think, uh, speak, express the things that were on my heart. Um, but watching them, you know, continue to love on each other. Um, and this goes back to, they're not in love at this point, but it's the duty and the respect and how they admire each other mm. even outside of those walls of the marriage showed me that love extends beyond this label mm. you know label is you know marriage has you know specific expectations but love can out outwill that um when you say you know what i'm going to out of duty and respect for this woman and this man continue to commit to our children and see no problem with us being friends as well even though things didn't work out Mm. For us and this or this iteration of in, uh, reincarnation however you want to look at it it didn't work out for us and I'm, we're not going to allow our kids to see that 
there's one way that you have to love, even though it was very difficult and hurt. Mm -hmm. um, but what happened was even in, in that, my mom's love for my father was something that I constantly seen, even though, and I, I'm, and this is, I, I used to pick their brains, even, you know, as someone that was navigating my own, you know, grief with the divorce, I wanted mm -hmm. to know what happened and why did it break down? Because at first, as a young teenager, I'm upset at my father. You want to protect your mom. But as right. I started to become a man and we were able to have that real conversation, I saw some of the things that he felt like he was not receiving. And I had to look at it from that lens. And then I had wow. to sit with mom and see what her perspective was and say, you know what, maybe they weren't meant to be with each other. Mm -hmm. But what I can do is I can say from the things that I saw that I love outside of, you know, how traumatic the experience was, I can learn to be patient. I can learn to be empathetic. I can learn to speak life. I can learn to be um, dutiful. Mm -hmm. I can take a very mature approach to, to marriage. And because they were married until I was a teenager, I was able to see the unification of a beautiful union until, and I was, because at that point I'm, I'm pretty much going into past preteen and, and making decisions. So I was able to already come up with an idea of, of what I wanted love to look like before mm. they, they separated. So, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, I'm, I'm thankful. And, and I think my, what's so, another interesting thing is my dad is your, you know, quote unquote, before we, we break down patriarchy, he was your, your man's man. And my mom was a woman's woman. So I was also able to see that, but also see how, regardless of what the role was, it always didn't matter if pops was was cooking and and mom was coming home late. It was just like we just did what had to get done, and that's how I learned to love. Wow. And uh, it helped me with, you know, some of those things that I see people struggle with. The patriarchal model is a egalitarian household. We just did what had to be done, and nobody felt emasculated or they felt like they were less than. It was just it was just love and and, and duty. So wow, man, that that's very powerful. I mean, just the whole sort of uh, your whole inquisitive nature at a young age to really yeah. ask your parents and and not just take a general answer from them oh we yeah. just like really dive in and and just your perspective to say okay i can see from my father's perspective i can see from my mother's perspective and then i still see how they you know coexist and still love each other i mean that's a lot that's a it's a lot of observation for a young for a young kid man you were very kind of insightful at a young age because most people would, i know would never look at their parents divorce like that and yeah, so yeah. you had that from you know a, a young age that sort of inquisitiveness and trying to understand things and yeah. and really understand like what love is and what relationships yeah. um and yeah. so it's no it, it's it's to me, it's no wonder how it, why it comes out so natural through your writing. Now, this whole movement around black women, and you know, you said you you stood on stage and you delivered that that poem in the, and then you you put a, a video out and you know it, it went viral. So there's something about, and I think a lot of people struggle with this, and this is what I want to ask you is like. Sometimes we we get this inclination or we get this the spirit comes to us to do something, to take action, go in a certain direction, but we fight it. Mm. Why did you answer the call? Like we get a call, but but we don't answer the call. Why yeah. did you answer the call? It goes back to like, you know, every time I'm in a room, especially when I'm I'm dealing with uh equity seeking seeking issues, whether it's you know, a kid with a disability, whether it's a black brother, I feel like I have the ancestors on my shoulders. I feel like it's something that I have to do because I'm brave enough and I have the courage to do it. And I, I've watched in spaces and it could be because of my experiences and seeing how I look at us um, in another space like Atlanta, Georgia, where I felt I see everybody as kings and queens and where the voice is not being heard or it's not being said, I'm gonna be that guy and I will take whatever response because there's one thing you know, I was talking to a friend about is we also have to realize people don't feel they may have something on their heart, but they may not be able to articulate in a way where it can be received by everybody. Yeah. So I think that one of the qualities of my superpowers is I can convey a message that may, if it's said the wrong way, may be harsh, but I can deliver it in a way where there's enough 
articulation where you hear it, but you don't feel like you're offended by it. So I think when mm. I said black woman, I said it with conviction, but I wasn't talking about anybody white. I was speaking about the love that I have for a black woman, the things that are being missed. And I think that to me allowed me to stay, um, stand 10 toes down on what I was saying. And a lot, of, a lot of people said, man, I don't know how you could do it because now you, you put yourself in a position where you, you, you kind of stuck yourself with black women. I said, well, right. that's, not the, that's not the point. I think, I think the point is, is that am I doing what I'm convicted by, what my heart is telling me to do? Yeah. And I think too often we think about you know, what's the repercussion, but if this is something you're willing to die for based on that statement, you should go ahead and do it. So yeah. I knew when it came out of my mouth, I couldn't take it back, but I was yeah. okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what the thing is? You can do other things. Like, right. Just because you're known, Michael Jordan was known, known as the greatest basketball. Like, think about this. Michael Jordan is considerably and arguably the best basketball player ever, right? Mm -hmm. In a lot of people's minds. For sure. How could you top that? People are like, there's no, you're the greatest basketball player ever. What does he do? He goes and becomes one of the first billionaires exactly. with his own clothing brand that surpasses many of the biggest brands in the world, the Jordan brand. That's right. And, and then he branches out into business and becomes like a business guru. Magic Johnson, the same thing. So all of that to say is like, we have to understand, and it's exactly what you said. Sometimes you're being called to do something at a specific time. That's right. And it might not be forever. It's there for you to make an impact, mm. for you to learn about yourself, to inspire yourself and ignite yourself and other people, mm. and then take that, everything you've learned from that experience and parlay it into something else. Absolutely. And I think where this stems from, and one of the biggest problems that I see is that when we're young, people say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. I know where you're going. Absolutely. And you're like, I don't know, a fireman, a doctor, a nurse. How would you know? I can ask somebody who's 45, 50 right now working in a job. What do you want to be when you grow up? And they have no idea because it's this thing where I have to lock into one thing for my whole life. Absolutely. As opposed to what are you passionate and curious about right now? Exactly. That opens that when you say right now is exactly what you're saying. I never, I, I'm just answering the call. I can uh, later on, if I choose to talk about something else or to be inspired, you can do that. So I, I see, that's how I see it. You can, you can let me know what you think. I totally agree. And I think that's why I wanted to, I always wanted every day's Valentine's day to be the bigger picture because you know, re, re, I mean, restoring love through artistic expression. That's why I said what you do is art. Mm. Is It's the idea that you are able to create. And when I think art, I think creation bringing forth. So it, I don't want to limit myself to being a poet. I want to speak. I want to be able to heal. I want to help in any capacity, a capacity, a capacity and continue to develop skills that speak to the overall idea of what everyday Valentine's Day is, which is mm. to love every, day, love every day like it's your last, which is a broad thing when you think about what you can do and how you can apply that. You can do that by you know, collaborating. You can do that by giving back, um, going to a shelter. You can do that by you know, dancing or speaking on a panel. You can do it by being a husband. There's mm. so many different ways you can do it. And I think um, one of the things I've been discussing lately is the long-term versus the short-term goal. Mm. I think a lot of times what we do is we over-romanticize what we want the future to be and we put all our, our positive emotion investment into the future, not realizing the day-to-day -day things that you can do to elicit positive emotions. So if we're doing those things on a daily basis, we can say that, you know, I'm living every day is Valentine's Day every single day. You don't have to wait for this quote unquote, one big purpose to be fulfilled. Mm. And then you're, you're minimizing the, all the great things that you're doing day to day that give you value. Wow. And I think it's like, you know, we've come from such a um, oppressed state of mind and we're moving into a space where we're owning our own that we just we want to run to the finish line and, and we'll get there. But what are the great things? This conversation, I'm going to write down in my journal, say, 
I spoke to Danny today. Yeah. That was like that was a win for me. Like yeah. I'm not gonna act like that small anymore. Yeah. Those things yeah. are big, but we say, okay, had an interview, and I'm gonna go on to the next thing. No, no, sit in that. Yo, give yourself a pat on the back for sitting down with a brother that you can share and express with. That's positive emotions. You yeah. need to write that down. So I think sometimes we minimize all the things that we do in a 24 hour clock, and then we feel like we're not doing enough or we're not enough. And I, and I think that's a big part of the conversation going forward is, especially with our brothers, is, you know, everything is not about necessarily being the millionaire tomorrow. It's mm -hmm. about all the things you can do in a 24 hour clock that give you that positive burst of expression that either can support yourself or your community. Mm. And you're good. You yeah, know, so. man, that's powerful. You know, I think, you know, waking up, being thankful and, and just what am I thankful for? Because mm -hmm. our brain is designed to protect us. And so it looks at things as, as you know, harmful. And, and we have to train our brain to help us to identify mm -hmm. the things that we're grateful for, our accomplishments and our achievements. That's right. And, you know, I was, um, I host um, this, uh, I started this, this group called Champion You. And Champion You uh, is a weekly conversation that we have uh, every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. on the Clubhouse app. Okay. And in there, we talk about everything, mindset, habits, relationships, all kinds of things. And we just had one last Tuesday. And, um, you know, one of the things that I was saying to, I said, I said, um, you know, this is an ask for everybody in this room. I said, I want everybody to write down everything that they've been able to achieve that they never thought they could accomplish. Mm -hmm. And that goes from the beginning of time. Graduate high school, drive a car, my first job, oh. a promotion, my business, right? And, and just keep adding to that list mm -hmm. forever as things come. Mm -hmm. And it's and we we have to do that because of what you said. When we're so focused on the end result, we forget how far we've already come. It's like, yeah. Man, I grew up in low income housing surrounded by drugs and crime. I was arrested three times before the age of 18. I saw a lot of crazy things in my life. So for me to, to not acknowledge I've come from all of that and I'm here because I'm not where I want to be is almost disrespectful to my ancestors, to my mother, my wow. grandparents. It's disrespectful to everybody. Sure. So I love what you're saying is like, Every day we have to find these moments of joy and happiness mm -hmm. and acknowledge ourselves mm -hmm. for what it is that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I also tell people like every day you wake up, you're building your legacy. Absolutely. Every interaction you have with people, they're going to remember that. Mm -hmm. The person that you go to at your coffee shop, the person at the gas station that you talk to. Mm -hmm. I was at a grocery store, uh, I think it was maybe about a week and a half ago. And I said to the, the cashier, I said, you know, how's your day going? She, she looked at me like, what? I said, how's your day going? Mm -hmm. She goes, oh, you know, I've had a couple, you know, rough customers. I said, well, you know what? I'm so thankful that you're here. Thank you for serving me. I saw how you were treating the people in front of me. You know, you're really doing a great job. Mm -hmm. And she almost started tearing up. Yeah. It's just be conscious of how we treat ourselves and other people. And that's what I love about your love mission. So like right now there might be, there's people who might be like, they don't love themselves. They're, they're struggling with their self-confidence. Like what would you say to somebody right now who just, they're not in a space where they really love themselves and uplift themselves? I want to add, to answer your question and add to what you're saying, I think it begins with mindfulness. Mm. I think, um, whether it's, and I think mindfulness obviously is a practice, but mindfulness makes you aware of the things that you are missing because you're too much in your head thinking about the future. Yeah. So I think part of my practice has been meditation, prayer, whatever silent time that you need for yourself to start being able to observe those thoughts in the mind, the feelings in the body. So you are now using that as a tool when you come outside of that that meditation to now go into other spaces and observe how you're feeling and thinking. Mm -hmm. And then once you understand how you can think and feel, you can observe 
the positive feeling. So that's I, sometimes when we talk about mindfulness, we talk about you know observing this flow of thoughts, and often it's a focus on ups, looking at the stream of negative thoughts and just allowing it to go. But mm -hmm. I think it's also observing the positive, so you now can see how positive you are on a daily basis. And I think mm -hmm. the accumulation of those positive positive experience will tell you how and show you that yo, I have the ability to love myself, which seems like a crazy statement, but the reality is, is that. We, we say we don't love ourselves because we don't feel we're worthy. Mm. But when we are experiencing enough um, good, joyful moments, we begin to embrace life and see the value that it brings. So I say first, it starts with the mindfulness. And then the second thing is, you know, we, we have this idea that, you know, there's this, always this conversation about being too emotional. I don't think anybody's too emotional. I think we are, sometimes we can be overreactive, but I think we are all emotional beings. So something like you said you, you spoke to the woman about what you saw and it's it's also learning the language of what are loving actions um every time that i learn to control my emotions um that's a loving loving action every time that i learn to have a positive interaction increase in my interpersonal skills that's a loving action every time mm -hmm. that i have a level of, of tolerance for a situation that's a loving action. Every time that I'm in service, the list goes on. But I think we have to know, start to learn how to identify through journaling. So to answer your question, starting to write down, and it sounds crazy, the times when I feel uh, I am exhibiting a positive display of love for myself. Mm. Because if you don't write it, you can't see it and you won't believe it. So obviously at that point, you're just saying, okay, I don't love myself. Well, prove, prove yourself wrong. That's Write good. it down, start to journal those things down and you will see how, like you were saying earlier, Danny, how many times in a day you actually love on yourself, you know, and, and it sounds, I think going back to what we said earlier, we, we make things too complicated because the world around us has told us that love and, and um, success is determined by some great outcome that the world has set the terms for. Right. I, I want people to focus on the fact of how do I feel, you know, the same way, like, you know, whether it's a, a you know, I, I just got a, a new, a new puppy and I got some plants and the feeling that those things elicit from me just mm. to take the time to watch it grow, just seeing one leaf grow. Yeah. I'm like, damn, this is, this yeah. is good. Yeah. Today was a good day. I got one leaf, you, yeah. know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, we don't really take the time to really embrace. And it starts with the mindfulness because we're, we're moving so fast. We're not, if I don't, if I don't take the time to see, to look at the plant, I don't see that there's an extra leaf. Yeah. And I'm, and, and the, the, the plant could grow into a full, full bloom. And I would have missed that whole process because I'm too busy focusing on something in the future. Right. Not appreciating that this, every time I water this plant and I nurture it, that's a win. So mm. I just think that it's the, um, it's taking the time first of mindfulness, second journaling, and then uh, three, giving yourself a pat on the back for the things that you accomplish in even a short amount of time. It could be 30 wow. days. I guarantee you'll see, you'll see the difference. Bro, that, like, you know, one of the, I, I'm power, I'm, I'm, I'm all in on mindfulness. You know, um, in my book, you have the keys and I'll drive. I talk about the eight M's of a powerful morning ritual. Come on. And it's, it's, um, you know, um, mind, mindset, mindfulness, meditation. Oh. Uh, and I talk about those things, right? Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a big proponent of that. And, and I also believe um, in the power of journaling. Come on. There's something about writing things down and, and you know, inking it, inking it into your, your brain and your subconscious and your spirit. And so I talk to people a lot about that. So I'm, I'm all for that. And one of the things I, I love that you said too, is like, we're so focused on the end result, but it's like, we got to celebrate the wins along the way. Yeah, yeah. Celebrate the wins along the way to remind yourself that, you know, you're, you're, you're doing a great job. Right. And it's really about that. And I think a lot of us haven't experienced love. Like we, you know, a lot of people haven't grown up in loving households and, and a lot of people have been in not so much toxic relationships, but relationships that weren't loving. And so I think we don't know how to kind of love ourselves and we have to train ourselves how to love ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I love what you're saying about, you know, mindfulness and writing things down and acknowledging yourself. These are the things that build up that kind of self-love in my mind. And, and, you know, I, it's hearing you say that and how you articulate it, I think is really great. I think a lot of people need to hear that right now. It's not a destination. 
and, and success is not a destination. When you're becoming a more heightened version of who you are, mm -hmm. you got to celebrate that. Exactly. For sure. yeah. yeah, man, that's good. And so for you, right, like, what are some of the things that you do when you get down on yourself? Because one of the things I talk about is I talk about this thing where we have to stop something before it becomes a belief, right? Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I say the minute that you get like a negative thought or something that, you know, you feel defeated, you have to shut it down. And so I have this thing that I teach my coaching clients is called, you know, catch, release, replace. Mm -hmm. Catch like the negative it. thought and you, you know, and then you release it. You thank your brain for trying to protect you because that's what your brain's trying to do. And you replace it with the truth, mm -hmm. something more powerful. Yep. So if I say I can't do something, I'm like, well, first of all, it's probably not your voice. It's somebody else's voice that told you you couldn't do something at some point in your life, a parent, a teacher. So I catch it and then I kind of figure out where it's coming from and I release it. I say, thank you for my brain trying to protect me, but I got it from here. Mm -hmm. And then I replace it with something more pow powerful and positive. Mm -hmm. Maybe I need more information. And so I teach people how to do that before it becomes a belief. And I try to do that with myself, but what are some of the things that you do for yourself when you kind of have these negative thoughts or you feel like you can't do something? How do you deal with that? I think there's different ways to reset. So I think that, um, what is it? Accepts is the acronym, right? So, you know, sometimes it's for one, you start with mindfulness. I always start there. And then you say to yourself, everything that you have in your life that you've developed that brings you a level of positivity is a resource. Mm -hmm. So it's about now using it as part of your toolbox and labeling, when can I use this? So for me, thoughts is one thing, sensory is another thing, emotions is another thing, activities, movements, another thing. So mm -hmm. an activity and the acronym is accept. So it's activity, activity, contribution could be doing something for someone else in that time before you revisit the because you at sometimes I think you need to take a step back and from that negative thought and revisit it because you might be too hard on yourself so the first thing I do is I apply one of these things where I might do an activity I might take a walk I might uh watch a show mm -hmm. um I might say okay you know what I need to take a step back from that let me go help a friend mm -hmm. um, I might look at previous situations that were more negative and see how maybe I'm you know being over embellishing the truth so I'm going to compare myself to people that, you know, have been in, in situations that were worse off and see, okay, is it really that bad? Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to look at my emotional state, you know, like you, you're just talking about what's, what am I, what, what's the emotion I'm feeling and what is the emotion that I can replace it with at this time? I might just, um, and then P is, is, is putting, putting the pain on the back seat. So sometimes there's this, this level of, of irritation that comes with it. So I might go meditate. And then going back to what you said with thoughts, I'm going to just, you know, might do something like a word search, do something that's going to take me away from that specific thought that I'm uh, perseverating on and constantly reminding myself of why I'm not good enough or why I feel like um, this is a negative thought or the reasons behind it and focus myself out, outward. And then I might do something sens sensory, like for me. Uh, putting an ice pack at the back of my neck works mm. finding something sensory to calm me down so i can have a a straight straight mind to think clear and then i'll revisit it and then i'll say to myself okay now that i've done this can do i have a, a, a honest approach to the situation can i see it from different vantage points that give me a clear understanding of how i want to approach this because sometimes mm. you leave with the emotional mind That's it's true. very you know uh responsive reactive and then you start to catastrophize or you personalize a situation and you're not seeing clearly. So I just lean on resources that I already have in my toolkit, take a step back, revisit it. And oftentimes, believe it or not, the thought is either, um, it's either been removed or I have another way of looking at the outcome. Mm. So I think that it's just, it's a habit of, of knowing your resources for you, what those things are when the being mindful of the onset of those things, taking a step back and then revisiting, which is very difficult because it's not a practice that we always do is identifying in this moment, I feel this way. What resource am I gonna pull from to now move me out of how I'm feeling it and then step back into it with a, a clear mind and make a more conscious or, or, or stronger decision. 
Man, so that's I love that. What I, do, yeah. <clears throat> I love that acronym. I love that. That's really good. Yeah. I think that's something that a lot of yeah. people can kind of take away. Mm. And really like, you know, changing your state, you know, changing. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, yeah. Talks yeah, about sure. changing your state sure. a lot, right? Mm -hmm. um, no, that's really powerful, man. I think f we're all naturally curious, creative, resourceful, yeah. and whole. You're not broken. And I think for a lot of people, and I often feel this way, you know, I've been a coach for coaching people for like, over 10 years. Come on now. And wow. life coaching, <laughs> business coaching, career, relationships. Yeah. And what I see is when people are out of sync, it's usually because they don't tap into the curiosity, creativity, or resourcefulness. Yes. So they go. It, so when you're not playing to that, you you're always going to feel out of sync. Mm -hmm. And so when you wake up every day, you do the same things, you go through the same emotions, the same types of conversations, and you're not conscious about it. You're not tapping into your curiosity, creativity, and resourcefulness. And because we're all born that way, you're born with that. And what happens is education. Um, your, your life situations, your work situations get you further and further away from that. And now you're just playing in the same box that you always played in. And so now you try to get out of it by saying, okay, I want this big, I want to be successful. Mm -hmm. And you make up in your mind that you want to chase those things because you realize something's out of sync, but you're not realizing it's simply just being aware and conscious of the conversations taking new perspectives on, yeah. on things, the curiosity, the creativity, and the resourcefulness. Yeah. And what you were talking about earlier, I call this, when people are stuck, I say you have to live a li your life like you're on, a little bit like you're on vacation. Exactly. I love that. When you're on vacation, you're so reflective. Yeah. The same plant that grows in your backyard <laughs> looks more beautiful. It's so beautiful. <laughs> oh, look at those tulips. Bro, you got them in your backyard, <laughs> but they just look so much beautiful when you're on vacation. That's right. That's right. Talk to a stranger. I would never talk to a stranger when you're on vacation. Hey, what do you work? What do you do? What you, you talk to strangers. You, you don't, um, everything is not catastrophized. You miss the bus to go on uh, your trip. You're like, all right, I'll catch the bus tomorrow. Or I'll catch it later on this afternoon. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I tell people to live life a little bit like you're on vacation. Like Don't that. stress over things that are outside of your control. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to the things that are going on. Have meaningful conversations with people that you don't know. Mm -hmm. Try new things that you've never tried. These are all of the things you do on vacation. So if you incorporate them into your life, you're not going to care that, that the train is late today and you're going to arrive five minutes late to work. You're not going to be so stressed. It's, it is what it is. Yeah. You might actually have a conversation with the person next to you on the train. Hey, so all of these things start to happen when you start to live your life a little bit like you're on vacation. I love it. So that's what, when you were saying that, I was like, yeah, I got to, I have to say that to him. That's dope. I like that. <laughs> man, so, man, I love this. So for you, since we were just talking about people have big goals and dreams, what's a big dream? What's a big dream that you have? I want to speak more. I think on, on, on international scale about love, I want my biggest dream is to be in a space where I can have a conversation that that becomes a echo chamber as well as a true, true voice for for the love that that I know can ex exist with all, within all of us. So just speaking on a grand scale more often in more spaces, I think we're in a time where, you know, you see it a lot on social media, everybody has this like, you know, battle of the sexes. And I think that cool, it starts a conversation, but I think we, we need to have transparent, open and deeper discussions about the nuances of love that we're not talking about, mm. I think. So my goal would be to, to spread that on a grand, a grand scale as often as possible. You know, because right now, you know, with timing, you know, I'm, I'm in the spaces that God or want me, wants me to be in. But I think that there's a lot of spaces I want to get to because I, I only live my life one way, you know, and it's it's I, I think it takes time to get to a place of authenticity. But like you said, yeah. living life like you're on vacation, you know, it, I think that's a choice. You know, mm -hmm. either that, you know, I talked about the difference between before I go back to that about, you know, desiring power or positive positive emotions um mm -hmm. what do you want more of because power is not always fun 
But I think if the goal is power, you have to understand that there's a lot of things that you're going to sacrifice in, in achieving that, that power. And a lot of people you're going to lose and a lot of relationships that won't be established and a lot of, you know, choice that could affect your wellness. So I think that for me, it's how do we get the world on a grand scale to elicit that, that, that knowing that they have that mm -hmm. could make the world a better place. And if I could do that on a grand scale, that would be my goal. And that can be, I think panels would be that one way of doing that. Um, hosting would be another way using all my, all my skill sets to now, you know, show people that this, who I am is a, is a model of, of truth, but also one where I want people to connect with themselves on such a higher frequency mm. that, you know, we, we now can challenge that narrative that, you know, like love is in the long term or, or our success exists to tomorrow. We can get it today. So yeah. I think that's from the heart. That's really, you know, I think people, you know, when, it, when you have a moniker, like every day is Valentine's day, it could, you know, one of it is I try to, you know, I'm not, you don't, you're not always, and you talked about it earlier, you're not always going to be happy, <laughs> you know, happy is fleeting, but you have to know how you're going to navigate during those times. And I think mm. that's a way of exhibiting love. And I think those things have to be talked about more often. And um, I think, yeah, yeah, I think that that would be my, my biggest thing. Is We're awesome. putting it out there in the universe, yeah, we, we, man. We it's, it's out be, there because it's, it's coming. Oh, oh yeah. Coming. Oh yeah. It's coming. It's coming. He's coming. <laughs> You know, if I, I can got see to put it. on a diaper with a, with a hair on, <laughs> I'm coming. <laughs> I can see it, bro. I see it everywhere. I'm going to see it on the side of people's cars. I'm going to see it on the baby's little outfits. Like, I'm, every day is Valentine's every Day, day is and they're going to know your name, Let's man. Let's go, man. We need Let's it. Go. We need more love. We need it. And, and I'm glad that you acknowledge that every day isn't beautiful and amazing. And you know what? I, I recently, like recently within the last six or seven months, I stopped saying that I'm having a bad day or I yesterday was a bad day. I've stopped the bad day. Mm -hmm. To me, there's no such thing as a bad day. Let's talk about that. You woke up. Yeah, That's exactly. a good thing. A lot of people don't wake up. You have a roof over your head. You have mm -hmm. clothes. It's not a bad day. Yeah. It's challenging and bad moments throughout the day. And so I've really changed my language and I'm, I'm working on it. I'm not perfect. But I really catching myself if I'm saying I'm having a bad day. No, I stop it. Mm -hmm. I've had some challenges today, mm -hmm. some setbacks today, mm -hmm. some failures today. Mm -hmm. But guess what? I still have all of these amazing things, a beautiful wife, a roof over my head, all of these things. So language, I think we have to start changing our language, mm -hmm. right? Because now we're, we start changing our thoughts and our programming. So I stopped saying bad day mm -hmm. and now it's just i've had some challenges or some bad and it just happened to me uh, on friday mm -hmm. on friday i'm gonna be completely honest i was on my way to having my highest paid speaking gig ever I love it. and it was a done deal almost i told them my right there like okay cool we're just gonna take this back to the committee for the keynote it looks like it's good so i'm like okay um, told my wife, whatever. Then they come back and they're like, oh, we got some bad news. We can't, we can't do that rate. And I said, okay, well, what rate can you do? And they kind of came from my rate all the way down below even half. Wow. And I was just like discouraged. And I'm like, man, I've been doing this for a long time, but it's not even about doing it. I said, I sent these people all of these testimonials. I sent them my, my media kit. I, you know, they creeped me on social media and they saw what people are saying in the comments alone that, you know, Danny, this real, and, and I just felt like defeated. And I was like, you know what? This is a lesson. This is a test. And so I got on, the, I got on, uh, I was texting with one of my boys, shout out to my boy, Jeff Martin, Jeff A.D. Martin. I was texting with him because he's a speaker. And we, we kind of had this conversation. We're like, you know what? It's just a test because one day these people aren't even going to be able to afford us. And I had to remind myself of my greatness and my impact. And I put together, I crafted another email and I came back at them. I said, nope, this is what I'm willing to do. And these are all the reasons why you guys can let me know it's a yes or a no. And I let it go. And over the last couple of years, 
I've just gotten better with letting things go. And once you let things go, that energy is gone. And then it opens up your eyes to new opportunities. Mm -hmm. So the last time that I had a speaking gig canceled, it got canceled and I let it go. Mm -hmm. Two days later, I got my biggest speaking gig ever. Come on, man. So we have, to, we have to start training ourselves to be like, you know what? That opportunity wasn't for me. It's not the right time. Something else is coming and change our lens and let it go. Exactly. And also, you know? that, like you were saying, that goes back to what we're talking about identifying the small victory. The victory in that is I stood on my values. Right. And, that's, and, and that sometimes we mistake, like again, sometimes the conflict with the big goal and the little goal. And at some time, I, I, at some point, I, I believe that we realize how valuable the small steps are or the small goals. I shouldn't say the little goal, but the smaller goals are because in that moment, it's, I want this. This could be a defining point in my legacy, but I also, it's going to be a victory if I stand on my value and do what is true to my heart. And those are the things where, you know, we're caught in that, those two points. And then we have to reflect back on it and we make the decision to lower our value. We have to deal with the dissonance of making a choice knowing we didn't feel good doing that. And long-term, that doesn't feel good. Yeah. You chose power over positive emotion in that situation. And I think those are the moments I'm proud of you, brother, for doing that because it sets the tone, not only for yourself, but those to follow to say that, look, there's a blessing in store for you ahead. If you mm. just wait mm. and be true to yourself and what you want your true outcome to be. And I think that, you know, those are the decisions in, you know, some, I don't even think that's a sacrifice, right? you know, because the outcome was, was guaranteed in two days. So that's powerful, man. Yeah. I, I applaud that. You know, yeah, I, I, I just uh, really believe, you know, I really believe that each one of us has a champion inside of us. And yeah. as a champion, the same people that you idolize for being, you know, highly successful and great and whatever that we follow, we have to understand that we have that same ability inside of us. But what that means is that you don't let a setback stop you because Come champions on. have had many failures and setbacks. Yeah, absolutely. And it's exactly what you said, which is what can I learn from this moment? Let me write this down. Okay, mm -hmm. this didn't work. Every time I tell this person about my dream, they talk me out of it. So I need to stop telling them. And once you start to get this information and really get curious about it and get creative about solutions, and then you got to put some discipline and rigor around what it is that you want, you're automatically going to no, notice things change because you're going to be like, I'm no longer telling that person. So I don't have that negative. Or every time I, I know that it's a struggle for me to go to the gym. So I set up all my stuff the night before. All I do is get out of bed, brush my teeth, whatever. My sneakers are ready. My bag is by the door. Like it's discipline, right? And I think a lot of people think it's motivation. Motivation doesn't last. Discipline is the thing that gets Serena Williams didn't want to wake up at four every morning and go and practice. You think that she was motivated to do that? That was discipline. And I think we have to understand the difference, right? What do you, what do you think about that? You gospel right now, brother. <laughs> no, no, you hit it right there because I was, I was thinking about whether it's yourself or in a relationship, you can't commit. You can't commit if you don't have discipline. And I think mm -hmm. what that goes back to over romanticizing, not only, I think when we talk about over romanticizing relationships, it's always about, you know, the fluffy, the falling in love, the flowers. When we talk about ourselves, self-love over romanticizing or falling in love with ourselves, we like to use the buzzwords and the terms and we can describe them. So we feel good about how that looks and we over romanticize mm -hmm. that. But the discipline is where when I see Danny and he's moving, he's shaking, he's smiling, that's not a front. That's because of the discipline curated that outcome because time and time again, you're saying, why is he like that? It's because of the discipline, the commitment to himself. And I think those two things get lost because it's, mm. In this process of talking about mindfulness and meditation, meditation is not an easy thing right away. You start with five, you go to 10, you go to 15. Yoga puts stress on the body. Working out requires you to push yourself. So all these things that we want eating right is something that has to be taken time. Going to bed on time, that's these, all these processes add up to eliciting positive emotions and feeling good, but it takes discipline and commitment. And you always have to ask yourself, am I ready for that? Because if I'm not, I have to have a look at myself and say, am I ready to love myself? Wow. And I think that's the, the problem. That, that's a piece when we're talking about discipline and commitment are such they're big words, just as big as love. 
Because you can't get to love if you're not willing to apply the discipline and the commitment. Come on, man. For yourself or in a relationship. And I think intellectualizing things is cool. We can talk about things all day. But at the end of the day, what is what is your action plan? Are you journaling? Are you really writing in that journal daily? Committing mm. to it through discipline. Mm. And I think those are the challenges that we meet when we have those real conversations with, you know, in group settings, as you as a coach is, are you ready to apply yourself in this way just for four months? Let's mm. not even, let's just start with two weeks, a week, mm. Mm. and then go and see. So I love what you said about, I was waiting for that word to come up, discipline <laughs> Because it sounds good. You know, we are <laughs> talking about let's, but when someone comes into my space, I hope that they can see that, okay, this guy, he's, re he's really intense when it comes to his, when it comes to his, his wellness routine, he doesn't play. Mm. And, you know, and I try to, to live that way. And I think mm. even going back to your saying about, you know, what my long-term goal is, it's not only to talk about it, is I want to, I want to be in a living example of living the practical life and loving mm. that life beyond anything even if success that i want because we all have aspirations is not here yet you're going to see me smiling and loving and it's not coming from a place of okay he's putting on a show no this is who i am yeah because of the discipline that i put in to live this way and i'll land the plane there but i love what you said that got me hype when you talk yeah, about no, it, it, man, it, that, no. was, that got me man i was like yeah let's go let's go <laughs> but, I, but i see that in you man i yeah, think yeah. the first time i met you you know <clears throat> on the beloved project, you know, when I interview you, I think it was you, Mark, and yeah, maybe Rudy. Rudy was there. Yeah. That's the first time that I met you. And uh, I could just tell with the energy, this, you know, it's a word that I don't really like to use, but this authenticity or this trueness to yourself. And, and I really like that because in a world, in the world right now, everybody, a lot of people are afraid to be themselves. And, you know, I used to work in the corporate world and, uh, I was recently doing some leadership work for a big financial institution and the contract ended. I wasn't even there that long. And so the team that I was kind of working with, they all got together and literally each one of them went around and said, man, the impact that I had made. Mm. And I'm like, I'm just here working, right? And one girl was like, you know, you just helped me to realize things about myself. And she started tearing up like, you know, the short amount of time that I've known you, you really positively impacted me. And someone else is like, you know, um, I remember that one time that you were, you, you were, you were talking in the group and she goes, I felt like I was at a Ted talk and it was like an awakening to my, my spirit. Like all, like, I was just like, but this is just me going and doing my yeah, thing. Right. You. But what I'm saying is, and then the guy that I was kind of reporting to at that time, he was like, I think your superpower is connection. Like you're able to connect with people and get them to see things about themselves that they didn't see. And I'm like, I'm glad you got that because that's what I think it is. I'm, not, I'm saying all of this to say, I showed up in that corporate environment just like me. And people, and actually somebody high up in the organization said, you have this balance of being able to be professional and casual and kind of blend them both yeah, together yeah, with yeah, who yeah. you are yep. and people really get it. And I'm like, that's it. Yeah. And I think it, we have to show up as ourselves. If you, <laughs> if I couldn't show up like that, I don't want to work there. I don't want to speak on the stage. I don't want you as my coaching client. Yeah, exactly. I don't want you as a guest on my podcast. Yeah, if yeah, I can't yeah. be myself and there's yeah. power in showing up as yourself, not who other people want you to be. And I realized this a long time ago in the corporate world, uh, working. I always started, once I made that click, I just showed up as myself unapologetically. Mm -hmm. And so I love what you're saying because yeah, yeah. who else are you supposed to be but yourself? That's it. That's it. Man. And, and sharing that space is like, you know, I can sit in admiration and say, oh man, there Danny go dropping another gem, man. <laughs> and, and love that because a lot of times it's like we, we're, we're being programmed to, to compete and to see a threat. And not everybody has to, uh, I mean, in, in specific situations, if you're someone's trying to take your life, I right. you feel threatened. But in most cases, you don't have to be, be threatened. When you're on threat and you're on survival, it's hard to really value or see how unique and special that individual, because everybody's special in their own way. Mm. You just have to sit and be still and listen and be like, because I'm moved by everybody. And I think that's where part of the energy comes from is that I want everybody to get a chance to speak their truth so I can mm -hmm. find a gem. Everybody has a gem. Mm -hmm. 
Me, I agree. Everybody has, if you just sit and listen, you, you, you're going to get a gem. And I just like the idea of, and you know, that's the whole thing. Of, I think that's why out of everything, I like hosting. Because mm. hosting, you're going to get me. You're going to get my energy, the, uh, the highs, the lows, the mist. I love making mistakes on stage. Yeah. It gives me an opportunity to show that I'm human and I want to be laughed at. I want to celebrate you. I like, that's because when you're, when you're in the poet, poet stance, they're paying for something. They're paying for you to say these words and recite them and they want something specific. But when you're in the host, you can go into any bag. Mm. And you get to interact with people. I get to sit down with every guest before the show and say, how are you doing? What I, I always say, you know, what, what's, what's your temperature like today? Tell me yeah. how, what brought you here? Yeah. And we laugh and we giggle. And I, I laugh so much in that setting. And I think it's not because of the hosting. It's because that's how I live my life. If I'm out on the street, I'm doing the same thing. Meeting somebody, like you said, oh, I love what you said on vacation. I'm saying, how you doing, man? I just want to say what's up. I, um, I pulled up to a guy the other day, caught him off guard. And he was listening to Barris Ham in the car. And I said, wheel it, wheel it back. And he looked at me like, what, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> right. I said, wheel it. Cause at first he's like, who is this brother telling me, sounds like he's yelling, but he sounds excited. And he wheeled back the song and we had a moment. Wow. And it was just something in my spirit said, tell him. Yeah. As much as I didn't say, brother, you know, I love you, man. It was like, we had a moment where we understood it was something that we resonated with the music that was making us feel a certain type of way. And I'm wow. saying, why hold back? I, I'm, I'm like, I'm like that. I'm completely <laughs> I know, like I that. I am from the bus driver to the guy. I'm like, people are like, what's up, brother? What? what? Yeah. I said, what's good, man? You all right? Yeah. Okay. Hey, my sister. Man, your right, hair right. is on point today. And part of that is I grew up in Nova Scotia which is Got the east part of Canada for people who are listening who are not by. So the eastern part of Canada, and it's really kind of like southern United States. People are just, yeah. all Black people speak to yeah. each other. You yeah. compliment people if you see something. And there's no hidden agendas. And so when I moved to Toronto 20-some years ago, that's how I've always been. And people thought it was kind of strange. And, you know, I would compliment a woman and just walk off or say, yeah. how you doing, brother? Walk up to somebody or acknowledge, see something in somebody. And people would just look at me like I'm really funny. And they still do sometimes today. But if I feel like I'm called to say something or do yeah. something, I'm doing it. Like, That's it. if I, if I, if I, if I, if I turns out that it wasn't well received and I try to explain it or I get embarrassed, it's like, all right, I, I, I did what I was thought I was called to do in that moment. Exactly. I thought it was going to help somebody and it didn't. So what? I'm, I'm, I just keep going. And, so and I, I love that energy that you're saying. <laughs> and I want to add, because it, it, everything always cycles back to something you said, and it goes back to the failure. It's like you, you learn to be good at interpersonal skills by trial and error. Oh, Sometimes yeah. it's not going to work. But next time you're like, I ain't going to do that. I might make the adjustment. But it's, it's almost like you have fun with the rejection. You understand that this is part of the path of perfecting, not to say that that's your, your goal, but you get more confident in how to navigate certain people and certain temperaments mm -hmm. by the trial and error with these experiences. And that's why I always tell people, if going back to what you're saying, when you fear something and it's negative, where do you go? Sometimes you got to go back into it mm -hmm. and see it as an opportunity to now try to change your lens and say, I'm trying to be better at this. Yes. I'm going to go back on stage again and I'm going to, um, <laughs> I'm jumping around, but I heard um, <laughs> I was listening to the shot yesterday with they had Draymond Green and, and PJ Tucker <laughs> and PJ Tucker is a funny dude. He's like, you know, LeBron scoring 45 on me. You gonna score 50. I'm going to be here the whole time. Give me six. <laughs> give me. I'm going to be here the whole time. Right. Every time is another opportunity to learn how to play you better, to defend you better. Because right. some people have a mindset that they just want to get better. They yeah. don't care what anybody else thinks. It's just, I want to be better at me. So give me 65. I don't care if you embarrass me. I'm going to yeah. be better with every possession. That's and I true. Think that's how you know I look at life is, oh, it didn't work. But there'll be another opportunity. And, I'm gonna, yeah. and I might get another rejection. But I'm going to keep on trying and, and tweak it until I, I get really good at this thing. And people are like, you know what? Yo, man, you got really good people skills. Well, man, a lot of a lot of rejection. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. You've been rejected a lot because you're people, I, man. You were reject. You must have been rejected probably at least a thousand times because you're really, really good. Like Nigel, you're such an amazing host. How many reje ten thousand rejections? That's what it took you to get this good. Wow. I don't know if I can. I'll never be that good because I'm bad with one rejection. 
You know what I mean? Like, yeah, for sure. <laughs> man, I love how you put that, though. Yeah. I love how you put you got to go back into the failure and the fear mm-hmm. and, and really and, and take it on. Too many people want to breeze past it, but you need to sit in it. And, and that's the champion mindset. Champion mindset is you sit in the fear, you sit in the discomfort, you learn from it, and you, you take the nuggets that you need to take to make it better the next time. Not just, you know, it didn't happen or, yeah, that was bad and on to the next thing. Like, no, sit in the failure, sit in the, the misstep, understand it. Because like I said, we're all naturally curious, creative, resourceful, and whole. So what can you take from that? Remix it to do better the next time. So, man, I love, I love this conversation. I got a couple more questions for you. Let's go, let's go. Um, the, this question I'm sure probably comes up a lot, but because you're kind of the, I'm sure people call you the love guru, the love expert. I'm sure they call you all of that. I know they do. <laughs> I, I just, that, that love guy, of, love right? Guy, yeah. <laughs> so because you're, you're known as this, like, do you, is, is there a lot of pressure on you in your relationship to be like, I got to keep my stuff on point because I'm, pra- I need to practice what I preach. Is that extra pressure? Like when you're in a relationship? In my relationship now, I wouldn't say it's extra pressure. And I, I think because it goes back to the quote unquote, being honest with what love is. And I think that, you know, even in my writing, I try to speak from a, a space from constantly trying, mm. like there's no end result in the writing. It's, it's, you know, I wish for this outcome, but also, you know, I want to be better at serving. I want to be better at, um, you know, the mistakes I've made. So it, it always positions myself in a place of what we continue to go through versus this is where I am. And I think Transparency. That's where the pressure comes in because I think when we're, you know, the idea of pandering is, you know, you're trying to get people to buy into this romanticization. And that's not my goal. My goal is to constantly talk about what growth looks like. Mm. And growth, like you said, it doesn't stop. There is no end result. You're keep, you keep on going. So I, that's the, how we apply that to, to our relationship. And I think that's, that's where I, I, it keeps me grounded because you never want to feel like you're, you're creating a narrative that doesn't reflect who you are or your life. You know, um, and then also, you know, it's by keeping the relationship private also helps because then we're able to separate the reality of, you know, what we are and we talk about those challenges and then that becomes a seed to how I'm going to write. Mm. So I think because she's a pivotal part of my writing process and she's not separate, it also brings that level of, of truth as well. So, but, do, but, but let me ask you, do you ever feel pressure to bring her out? Like, because because especially because of what you talk about is there is there a pressure for you to to bring to to make it public your more about your relationship and do you find that pressure ah oh, that's a great question i think not so much pressure but i i think that there's the the notion of 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 her being judged her being judged based on the expectation of people putting something I should be with. So we've talked about that, the idea that, you know, um, because me as a person or whatever position that you're in, you get over romanticized. I seen with this woman or he should be that way. And I think just like, uh, you know, I've, you know, talked about the idea of of why other people keep their relationships private, but I also don't want to be our relationship to be the poster board board of of the love the love conversation so it's like you know there's that idea like do you do you do those that um are in our circle and people know who she is of course so she can't you can't hide your love Mm -hmm. but i think that there's this fine line with how much you share because of again like what comes with this expectation of who you are to the public so it's such a it's such an interesting thing but it's not pressure but it's like this this you're protecting you're protecting the your your covenant and i think that's the best it's, way it's tough the reason i yeah. asked you because yeah. me and my wife are both public private people right my wife yeah yeah, yeah. she's on a national program with yeah. health and wellness experts she has her podcast you know the mind your body show she has a book out unbreakable yeah so she's out there Shout and out i'm out me. here and yeah. so we're public private people mm-hmm. and a lot of people 
put a, a lot on our relationship. Like a lot of people are like, I see how you and your wife are, you know, it's black love. It's two people who love each yeah. other and support each other publicly and behind the scenes. Yeah. And so we're kind of, we're, tr we're trying to find the balance of the public private thing and we don't want people to be like, you guys are the poster for yeah. relationships, right? Yeah, exactly. So we, we're honest, like we have ups and downs and we publicly say what we want to say about yeah. the ups and downs, but it's a lot of, we don't find pressure. It's just it, the, exactly. the more that we start to build together and we feel like at some points we should do some things together mm -hmm. because we feel that people are just asking us. But at the same time, we have to let people know, look, we're not the poster for any relationship. We, we have ups and downs and we're, we're still trying to figure out ourselves and love ourselves more like any other person. So mm -hmm. that's why I asked you, because you being the love person, we're just, yeah. I'm just a coach, coach Stone. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. Stone. So that's right. what I was kind of asking you, because, you know, a lot of people ask us to do stuff together and want to hear from us more together about our yep. relationship. And it's a real balance for us. We're kind of just cautious about what we choose to do together. And you yeah, know, walking, that's you. walking the middle path is tough. And I think that's a that's a challenge just in, in you know, when we talk about overall the balance of life and the flexibility of life. It's finding how you're gonna create that balance. But I totally agree with you. I've had someone people DM me and say, you know, we wanna see your girlfriend more because you give us hope. And I'm like, All right, well, you know, I shouldn't be, I'm not, I can't. <laughs> I don't want to be the person that's giving right. you hope because you see something, you right. know? And I think that that was like, I was like, wow, that's, that's a real thing. People want to see that. And no, then but it is a real thing because yeah. you look at the Cosby show, you look yeah. at Prince, it's a real thing. When you, yeah. they see it, we saw that when we saw a different world, black colleges. So yeah, I understand when people see it, it gives you hope because you rarely see it. Yeah, it, exactly. Talk and so that's why I understand why people yeah. are asking us, but it's still kind of a thing where we're just <laughs> yeah, and then, ourselves. And then for you as well, it's, it's, you know, with you, you guys, because of what you do get also get the moniker power couple. So that that's, that's another level yeah. because, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, in your own right, you guys have your own platform and you've been on breakfast television at different times. So it's like, you guys get the power couple, which is a yeah. whole different ball game. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It, man. It's, it's like, <laughs> but anyways, we land the play. We, we know yeah. what that's about. We, you know, your boundaries though. I think yeah. about the key is yeah, Like I said, we're private, we're public private people. So, yeah. you know, we share what we share, but yeah, man, this is, this is a real interesting conversation, man. I could talk to you forever, man. Yeah, I, you I know, the time, I'm like, man, this is, this is I, not enough time. We got to do. No, no. Do. You listen. Panel, no. Let's go. <laughs> I, got, I got two final quick questions for you that I ask all my guests. So the first one is, what does grind mean to you? Mm. Grind. I'm going to use pressure differently. You know, applying consistent pressure on your goals. Mm. Applying consistent pressure on your goals. When your goals are sleeping, you say, let's go. Nope, it's time to move, let's go. You know, when the body's saying, don't get up at five, now you say, let's go. You put pressure on your goals to move them forward and you are resilient at applying that pressure. That's what grind is to me. Because when you do that, it's, it's impossible for you not to meet your outcomes. So that would be, that would be right there. Ooh, that is one of the best, that's one of the best I've ever heard. Woo, okay, we're going to clip that. That's a clip. That's a bar. Okay. Uh, and my final question that I ask all my guests, what does gratitude mean to you? Mm. Appreciation. Um, appreciation for, for life, um, for anything that you have. It's the... It's like this whole conversation we've been been having about, you know, appreciating the little things through mindfulness. You know, the first thing I do up do when I get up is I I say I'm I'm grateful just to be alive and breathing, and for for God to choose uh, giving me another day to uh, leave my impression. Like I, I you know I, that's not guaranteed tomorrow morning. You know, nothing's not is, isn't guaranteed. So I'm I'm it's about you know just being grateful and. Um, appreciating everything that I have thus far and everything that I possibly could gain tomorrow. 
and it's just that simple, you know. And I, you know, I think I've I've always been a kid. Just to, to give you context, you know, even when I was young, going back to like the, um, it was, it's a weird thing. I've always thought about death a lot. There was one time I remember almost passing out when I was very young, thinking about the idea and what happens next. It's always been something that, you know, has been on my mind since I was as a young kid. Just the idea of like. You're only here for a short time. Like there's even times, even in in my recently, where I think about this is it, you know. And you you it sounds you know very, you know you're you're making it larger than what it is. But for me, it's like I'll never see Danny again. I don't know what happens, you know, um, to this person. I'm I'm never gonna see like once you. This is only time you have, and you know you have faith that you come back, whatever your belief is. But you you only get to do this possibly one time in this form and in, in this fashion. You don't know what you're gonna come back as or how it's gonna play out ne next round or however that looks. So with that, it's like there's this specific tie to great gratitude that I have because it's that serious to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I you know they say when you keep death close to your heart, it's a blessing. I've had the blessing of every day thinking about in like you already see my curiosity like what is the next path looks like what happens when we leave this place so that's something that every couple months comes back to my mind and it intensifies my appreciation for gratitude and it's something that i've always had since i was a kid it's been mm -hmm. intense and i you know i remember being in the bathroom upstairs my parents bathroom seven years old almost passing out thinking about the depths of this this death thing, and I'm like, I'm so young. Why why was I thinking about it that early? But it's so I'm so grateful for life. Mm. You know, I always reflect on that that moment when I was a kid, and it's it's crazy to me. But I always that's why I, I just go full force with everything. Mm. So just wanted to drop that in wow. there. That yeah, is powerful, cool. man. That is very <laughs> powerful, man. This has been an amazing conversation. Nigel Birch Jr., brother, thank you so much. Appreciate it. You know, you're you're an artist. You're, you're definitely sort of um, somebody who's moving love and self-love and forgiveness and up forward. And, you know, I'm just wishing you all the blessings in the world and putting that message out in the world because we need it. Where can people find out more about you? Let them, um, let, let them know. All right. So my website is edxvd edxvd.com it's an acronym for every day is valentine's day you can also find me on all social media platforms at nigel birch is edxvd um, i have a book a memoirs of mona that's currently out i'm working on a second book so if you like what you heard here and you're looking for some other you know words of motivation you can find that on my website as well as merch i sell t-shirts and sweaters and such and uh, hopefully you'll see me at a city near you, whether it's on the stage performing, hosting, or on a panel. I am putting this out in the universe, a panel or you know, a retreat with my boy, Danny. So that's all I have for you today. And as I always say, love of the day is like your last and uh, keep it tight. <laughs> Man, all right, everybody, make sure that you follow him, go to his website, get the book, grab the merch, it's beautiful. And you know, just continue to support the love movement. That's it. You know, Nigel, I just want to say thanks again. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into the Grind and Gratitude show. Make sure that you share this episode, you like it, you subscribe to the podcast, you leave a review, make sure you follow Nigel. And, you know, of course, I'm always here every single Monday dropping a brand new episode. That is it for the Grind and Gratitude show. I will catch you in the next episode. Take care, everyone.